Greetings, AP Calculus BC students. Mr. Record here for our second vector application problem dealing with an airliner flying with a little bit of a crosswind. I call this my big old jet airliner problem. And if you guys have that reference with the Steve Miller band, bonus points for you. So let's take a look at example number eight. So here we are, all buckled in, ready for our flight. Let's see what the problem says. I've got a plane that's traveling 500 miles per hour, very typical for a cruising jet airliner, in the direction of 120 degrees. Hmm. It encounters a wind of 80 miles per hour in the direction of 45 degrees. What is the resultant speed and direction of the plane? Pretty typical vector question here. Now. Unlike my example that I did in part in, 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 in video number seven, I am going to use a vertical orientation for my picture here. And the reason is because this problem kind of begs that. By giving you these degree measures without any type of reference, like we did in example seven, the only reference that we can assume is from a straight horizontal here, just like we would measure from the unit circle, right and 120 degrees would look something oh maybe about like that that would be the direction that this plane truly would like to travel that's its path that's its flight plan and it's going to do so with a force of 500 miles per hour and you can think of that speed as a force now the problem is is that we've got an 80 mile per hour, that's a pretty heavy wind, in the direction of 45 degrees. Well, we know that 45 degrees is right about here, let's say. Yeah, we could put that vector right here. I could draw this vector. In fact, by golly, I'm going to draw that vector right here. How's that? I could draw that vector just like that. Try to make it about 80 in, in length. But it's going to make a little bit more sense if we think about adding these vectors because they're kind of working uh, in the same environment, which means we can add vectors by using our tip to tail method, which means I can just take this vector, put its tail to the tip of this previous vector, and the plane that we're talking about here is actually wanting to travel along this purple path. And I'm going to highlight that purple path because that's an important pathway, guys that's what the plane's wanting to do if we don't make any compensation which means the pilots would know that they would have to make sure that they're sort of steering out to an angle heading out on a bearing that's greater than that 120 degrees to compensate for the wind and trust me pilots definitely know that and they definitely do that so our job is to figure out what is the length of this vector because that would be its speed and then ultimately what is the direction that we're heading in. So let's jump right to it. So we're going to say that our force vector, just like we, we talked about before, in fact, let's stay with purple because that's what this vector is. It's a purple vector. This force is just going to be the 500 force acting upon the vector that has the angle of 120. So you have your 500 multiplied by the cosine of 120 degrees multiplied by I plus the sine of 120 degrees multiplied by j. And then to that, we're going to add our wind. And our wind is going to operate with this force of 45 multi, uh, miles per hour. And then we have the cosine of, and because this is technically a positive angle with that horizontal, we can truly call it positive 45 degrees. And we set up both our I and J component, probably as you could predict. So there is your setup. It's going to be very difficult to mess up this problem at this point because um, you could, in some cases, use a calculator. Now, let's say for this one, we don't use a calculator just to kind of get things simplified. Maybe you've got a problem that says, hey, which of the following vectors would depict this resultant vector in a simplified form? And maybe this is a no calculator problem. Well, that means you would have to know 
a few things. You would have to know that the cosine of 120 degrees, well, the cosine of 120 degrees really isn't that much different than the cosine of 60 degrees, right? It's just that you're in a slightly different quadrant. So when you think of 120 right here, that's just the reference angle of 60 degrees. But remember, all students take calculus, right? That's our hope. So that means that cosine is going to be negative in that quadrant. And I believe you can say that you've got a 1 square root 3 and a 2 around that 60 degree angle. Remember, the 60 degree angle is right here. And so the cosine is going to be a half, but with a negative sign. And so you're going to know, hopefully, that this is negative half i. And then if you do the same thing with the cosine, it's a little bit easier because your opposite over hypotenuse is square root of 3 over 2. And because you're in quadrant 2, sine's going to stay positive. Okay. Now, if I went a little too fast there, feel free to kind of rewind, and maybe you can watch rewatch that and, and see how we put that together. Now, for the 45-degree angle, uh, unfortunately, this picture is not going to work anymore for me, so I can just put together a brand new shape here with 45 degrees right here, and I can use 1, 1, and square root of 2. So 1 over the square root of 2 is going to serve as both the cosine of the angle and the sine of the angle. Now, I feel proud that I was able to get this to this state, but at this stage, especially without using a calculator. But at this point here, outside of maybe distributing our 500, I don't know what else we can really do. Um, because it's going to start to get just a little bumpy here. Hey, we're on a plane ride, right? A little bit of turbulence happening right here. So let's go ahead and make those distributions. Uh, I won't do anything fancy over here with the 45. I'll just write it on top of the square root of 2. like such. Like I said, I don't really feel super motivated to add negative 250 and 45 over the square root of 2. So let's say that we reach for the calculator. We're going to have to anyway when we find uh, the, the resultant force and the angle. And the angle. So if I get these two uh, transferred into decimal form, it turns out that I have negative 218 times 0 0.180, and I would certainly invite you to pause this video, type these in your calculator, and see if you get the same thing. 464.833 multiplied by j, and that would be my resultant force vector, but my resultant force is going to require that I take the square root of both of these. And so I would take negative 218.180 squared added to 464.833 squared. And again, to reduce the length of the video, my plan was to show you what the calculations were and trust that you can enter these into the calculator. But be careful. You want to make sure you do this correctly. Um, a little advice that I have is that if you're doing a string of application to vector problems, it's very likely that you have an entry in your calculator that's the square root of a couple of pretty nasty decimals, each squared and added. You could just go up, highlight that particular entry, hit enter, and then you could just edit the values that are in these parentheses to match your new problem. And so therefore you can use sort of the, the template of this distance formula. If all goes well, you should get 513.490. And this would still be in miles per hour, um, which is pretty cool because this plane is getting a little help from the wind. It happens all the time um, in, in commercial uh, and aviation. Now we do need to figure out what our um, um, angle measure is going to be at this point. So let's take a look at that and let's see if I've got enough room to write below here. Yep, looks like I do. So for our angle, I'll write this in green. We know that theta is the inverse tangent of the y component divided by the x component. So you've got 464.833 
divided by negative 218.180. Now, if you were to enter this into your calculator, and we're going to stay in radians for right now, we know that this is going to produce a radian result, we end up with approximately negative 1.132. Um, now, if you were to add uh, I'm sorry, convert this to degrees, it's very likely that it's not going to make a whole lot of sense. In fact, it, it's it's actually going to tell you that your plane is going backwards. I think this is going to produce an angle that takes you this direction, which, like I said, is completely nonsense with the wind blowing to the sort of northwest. And the reason why that's like that is because we have an x value with a negative. Maybe you remember our discussion of that earlier. Right here. This is very problematic. And anytime that you use this inverse tangent relationship, whether it's with parametrics or in vectors, and you have that negative x, you are obligated to multiply by pi 180 degrees so that you can flip that guy around to the other side. And in doing this, um, and afterwards, multiplying by 180 over pi, which is going to convert everything to a nice degree measure, you're going to end up with 115.144. And I definitely want you guys to uh, follow through with this on the calculator to make sure that it makes sense. And what's nice about this is that you could conceivably leave this answer as such because we know that we are measuring this from this horizontal. And so therefore we're saying that this angle right here is that 115 degree angle, which certainly looks logical in relation to the picture. Now, there are other ways that you could express this. You could say, well, really what's going on here is if we go straight north at 90 degrees, and if we subtract 90 degrees from this result, we end up with an answer of 25.144. And so it's possible that you could hear the bearing is 25.144 degrees west of north because that's exactly what's happening, right? This straight vertical line is north, and I've got this extra 15 degrees approximately that's west of north. So things like that can creep into the problem. I think sometimes that makes it a little bit overcomplicated because we've done so much to get to our correct answer that how do we want to interpret this final angle? It can be a little bit tricky. But I think the thing that's most important to remember about this example, and this is why I chose it, is that you have this negative value for the x component, which requires the addition of the pi. Anyway, I hope you've enjoyed our flight aboard AP Calculus BC Airlines. We hope you enjoy the video, and we look forward to seeing you next time.